The winds of change blowing through the NFL for eight weeks have swept away the boundaries separating the best from the rest. Even the Steelers are caught in the whirlwind. Against Cleveland, subs Cliff Stout and Theo Bell, number 83, help them get their bearings. Stout threw for over 300 yards while Terry Bradshaw and a host of other ailing world champions sat this one out. But the blocking of Rocky Blyer, number 20, proved that there was still life in the old guard. Number 27, Greg Hawthorne, scored twice, and the crew of old faces and news steered the Steelers toward a 13-7 halftime lead. But in the second half, Pittsburgh gradually ran aground as Brian Sipes' passes added more force and fury to the winds of change. Sure hands of receivers like Ozzie Newsom, number 82, enabled Sipe to complete a club record 28 passes. And the return of injury plague Greg Pruitt, number 34, to the starting lineup was marked by his two touchdown receptions. Cleveland earned a 27-26 victory and a share of first place in the AFC Central when Sipe hit Newsom for an 18-yard score. Brown's last beat Pittsburgh in 1976, which coincidentally was the last season that the Steelers lost three straight. It was also a year in which they failed to appear in the Super Bowl. Thus, Pittsburgh must beware of lightning striking twice as they navigate the eye of a hurricane. Even with the Steelers becoming unhinged, Bum Phillips may not have to kick in the door. His best bet is to let Earl Campbell run right through it. A pair of Campbell touchdowns, including a 55-yarder, spearheaded the Oilers' 23-3 victory over Cincinnati. Houston, Cleveland, and Pittsburgh battling for the number one position in the AFC Central, there looms a battle that is likely to produce one large heap of splinters by the old door come season's end. Number one in the NFC West was at stake when Vince Ferragamo and the Rams showed up in Atlanta. Ferragamo has generated plenty of heat so far this season, but Atlanta's Steve Bartkowski has not exactly been cold. In this game, he came out smoking. Bartkowski's scoring pass to Alfred Jackson, number 85, enabled the Falcons to draw first blood. But in the second half, Ferragamo and Drew Hill, number 87, struck back in a big way. The Rams took a 10-7 lead into the fourth quarter. But with two minutes and 22 seconds remaining in the game, an Atlanta drive afforded a microcosm of the NFL's up and down 1980 season. Jack Youngblood, number 85, brought Bartkowski way down. Bartkowski rebounded from the nine yard loss with a completion, but a penalty moved the Falcons backwards. Then Youngblood did the same as he blew past number 66 tackle Warren Bryant to throw Bartkowski for a 15-yard loss. Youngblood's rampage allowed Los Angeles to glimpse light at the end of the tunnel as Atlanta faced a third and 38 from their own 19. But on this next assault, Youngblood found himself double teamed by Bryant and setback Lynn Kane and Bartkowski found himself with time enough to complete a 27-yard pass to Jackson. Still a fourth and 11 left Atlanta confronting impossible odds with less than a minute and a half remaining. But if there's one thing that has been proven this season, it is that nothing is impossible.
Bartkowski's 54-yard pass to Jackson gave the Falcons a 13-10 win and moved them into a tie with the Rams for first in the NFC West. At the midway point of a knockdown, dragout season, surprises keep piling up, swept along by the NFL's winds of change. No one will debate that the Baltimore Colts are a totally different team with Burt Jones than without him. Number seven's healthy return this season has made the Colts one of the NFL's surprises through the halfway point. But one other aspect that hasn't hurt Baltimore is a defense that flashes occasional brilliance. Against St. Louis last week, these defenders limited O.J. Anderson to 51 yards, and the only touchdowns the Cardinals produced seemed to be grabbed right out of a magical hat. These proved to be the difference, because in the end, Cardinal receivers made the vital catches Colt receivers could not. Unable to clutch the few opportunities presented them, Baltimore lost its edge. Of course, the St. Louis defense had something to do with it, as they chased down Burt Jones with every type of pass rush imaginable. The Cardinals figured the best way to harass number seven was through the blitz, and all day long, linebackers like Mark Arneson, number 57, tore down Colt protection and dismantled Baltimore's chances of winning. When it wasn't a linebacker, it was usually number 75, Curtis Greer, who delivered the bad news to Jones. Greer's four and a half sacks highlighted an NFL single game record of 12 quarterback traps by the Cardinal defense. And this was the difference in a 17 to 10 St. Louis victory. For Burt Jones, it's not going to get much easier because this week his Colts will be facing one of the best young defenses in the NFL. The Kansas City Chiefs are led by Art Still, a defensive end who has been known to put some heat on a quarterback. Last Sunday, the Chiefs spent a good deal of time trying to put a lasso on Detroit super rookie Billy Sims, number 20. But darned if that rope didn't keep breaking. Behind perfectly timed blocks and with some steps all his own, Sims danced for a total of 155 yards and two touchdowns. But for every trick up Detroit's sleeve, Kansas City countered. Their dealer was second-year quarterback Steve Fuller, number four, who has suddenly become quite good at delivering last-minute victories. With a rugged style that is similar to Baltimore's Burt Jones, Fuller scrambled and passed the Chiefs to a 20-17 win. One of Sunday's feature attractions will be the Chiefs against the Colts, two young clubs of similar style who realize that the outcome of this game could easily become the roadmap their team may follow in the second half of 1980. In Oakland last week, the only map the Raiders cared anything about led to Seattle's pass pocket. Six times during the day, Raider rush men like Cedric Hardman, number 86, stormed in on Jim Zorn to register quarterback traps. Oakland's defense never gave Zorn a moment's rest. 
while its offense glided on the suddenly brilliant touch of Jim Plunkett, number 16. Number 85, Bob Chandler, caught three Plunkett touchdown passes as the Raiders buried the Seahawks 33 to 14. When the season began, the Oakland Raiders were a team that was regarded as little more than an also-ran. Obviously, things have changed, as at the halfway point, they lead the AFC's Western Division. Beauty and the Beast. Halloween seems to bring out the best in people. Dick Nolan hoped his Saints would be treated to a little magic, their first victory of the season. Archie Manning has been the only bright spot in an otherwise dismal offensive performance. The offensive line's inability to execute assigned blocks has been the Saints' downfall. Their running game ranks last in the NFL. Against Washington, the Saints' problems were compounded by a rejuvenated Mark Mosley. New Orleans watched Mosley kick five field goals as the league's most accurate kicker a year ago snapped a four for 14 slump. The Saints were also victimized by a suddenly explosive redskin ground attack led by number 40, Wilbur Jackson. Key to the Redskins offense is quarterback Joe Theismann. His touchdown to Ricky Thompson, number 83, was the damaging blow in a 22-14 Washington victory, keeping the Saints winless at the season's halfway mark. Two teams heading in opposite directions. Archie Manning's brilliance cannot rescue the Saints, while Joe Theismann has sparked a Redskin resurgence. Another team on the move is the Green Bay Packers. Expected to be the NFC's doormat, the Pack has won three games and came within 16 seconds of a victory over the Cleveland Browns. Against the Vikings, Green Bay's offense continued to be surprisingly effective. Eddie Lee Ivory, number 40, supplied the running punch, while Lynn Dickey threw a touchdown pass for the fourth straight game. Dickey's toss to reserve tight end Bill Larson were the only points the Packers needed to defeat Minnesota 16-3. Green Bay has quietly entered the playoff chase in the NFC Central, the only division in football with but one team over 500. A Halloween ghost? No, simply a 45-mile-per-hour wind sweeping across Buffalo's rich stadium. First place was at stake as the Patriots visited the Arctic Zone. But quarterback Steve Grogan of New England and Joe Ferguson of the Bills seemed to weather the storm as each toss touchdown passes. This divisional struggle would be decided by two factors, and both were on the side of the Buffalo Bills. The first was defense. Entering the game, Buffalo owned the second toughest in the AFC. Against New England, the Bills did nothing to harm that ranking. Bill's linebacker-oriented defense, led by inside backers Jim Haslett and Shane Nelson, number 59, held New England's top-rated running game to 39 yards. Buffalo's balanced attack, anchored by a strong offensive line, played it safe against the Patriots' powerful defense, with Ferguson throwing short passes to backs like Curtis Brown, number 47. But the second factor and the difference in the game was rookie running back Joe Cribbs. Cribbs has quickly become the AFC's finest all-purpose back. 
and his fourth quarter show propelled Buffalo to a 31-13 victory. The workhorse of the Bills offense, Cribs carried 30 times for 118 yards and two scores. His second touchdown was highlighted by a fine block by number 67, Reggie McKenzie, allowing Cribs to turn the corner untouched. The Swift Cribs had again led the Bills to a win. When it was over, Buffalo had a share of the AFC East lead. Their surprisingly easy win over New England left the Bills with a piece of the conference's best record. The Dallas Cowboys have won more interconference games than any other team in the NFC, but that record was largely built by Roger Staubach, not number 11, Danny White, whose every mistake is magnified in this transition period of Cowboy quarterbacks. Facing the high-voltage lightning of the San Diego Chargers, Dallas needed a victory to stay within one game of the Eagles in the NFC East. Often luck, fate, and the bounce of the ball determines such a must game. The Chargers possessed equal measures of all these ingredients, plus the added spice of number 83, John Jefferson, the best receiver in pro football. With Jefferson and Charlie Joyner drawing double coverage at the flanks, it is almost impossible to defense their six foot six inch, 250 pound tight end, Kellen Winslow, number 80. The Cowboys trailed 24 to 14 at halftime and seemed at a dead end until their stumpy old war horse, number 44, Robert Newhouse, ran a few roadblocks. Extra effort became first nature in the final 30 minutes. The Cowboys' skillful core of wide receivers led by Tony Hill were not timid about sacrificing their bodies over the middle. The shadow of Staubach, which at times has darkened the spirit of Danny White, dissolved with each touchdown pass he threw. His ability as a comeback quarterback, a previously unanswered question, was resolved by 28 straight points in 20 minutes. The prettiest of the four touchdowns was registered after a typical bit of flim-flam. Tight end Jay Saldi, number 87, was aided by center John Fitzgerald's destruction of number 74, Louis Kelcher. On a night when defense took a holiday, the two highest scoring teams in pro football put up 73 points as Dallas won 42 to 31. There is no better place for a holiday than San Francisco, a setting where two teams, the 49ers and Tampa Bay Buccaneers, sought a timeout from losing. The Bucks' miracle season of a year ago has been shattered this year by injuries and a tough schedule. While the 49ers, after opening 1980 with three straight victories, have come crashing back to earth from a bracing dose of reality. Freddy Solomon's 53-yard scamper was the first punt return for a touchdown this season in the NFL. The 49ers sat down Steve DeBerg because quarterback Joe Montana, number 16, is more maneuverable, a skill never more evident than on this scoring strike to Lenville Elliott, number 35. While scoring points has never been a problem with the 49ers, neither is allowing them. Their defense is the most generous in the NFL, and this brutal fact was brought home vividly by Jerry Eckwood, number 43. Tampa Bay sent the 49ers tumbling to their fifth straight defeat by eking out a one-point victory, 24 to 23. The win also kept the Bucks alive in the NFC Central, a division that might well be won by a team with a losing record.
Mediocrity is not the case in the NFC East, where the bruised and battered Philadelphia Eagles keep winning, despite the fact that every Sunday, more players are helped off the field than carried off victoriously on the shoulders of their teammates. Facing the Chicago Bears, the Eagles met a team whose capacity for dishing out punishment remains undiminished from the years when they were called the Monsters of the Midway. On one afternoon, Chicago meted out a season's worth of hits. The most destructive blow was registered by number 73, Mike Hartenstein, who blindsided quarterback Ron Jaworski. This one tackle might have seriously crippled Eagle hopes for a championship season. But Jaworski typifies this physically and mentally tough Eagle team, which seems to possess the faculty for overcoming adversity and gutting out victory in the clutch. Philadelphia stretched itself to the limit to win 17 to 14. And at the midpoint of the 1980 season, their record is the best in pro football.